Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. Now, I'm going to start this episode by saying something controversial. Bullying is bad. I know, I know. Shocking. I can only imagine what you are all thinking. <gasps> Drake! How could you say something so brave? Well, dear viewer, it is my responsibility as a public figure to say things that most people already agree with, while obnoxiously flaunting my own moral superiority as if I were changing the world, when in reality I'm just living life as a social parasite while not doing a damn thing. Amazing! Twitter just gave me a blue check mark, and I don't even have a Twitter! All right, that's enough mocking woke celebrities for one day. Today's story stars an OP who just wanted to play some D&D, and how a power-tripping DM and player made OP's group a living hell. Now, without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This story is titled... DM and player bullies party members, cheats and metagames to look good around the table. So this is the story of the first DM many of my group had ever had, and how, both as a DM and player, he tried using the hobby of TTRPGs to try to assert his dominance over his social group, leading to endless DM versus player encounters that bogged down his entire campaign out-and-out -out bullying of younger players, screwing over other players' plans, and finally, straight-up murdering a player's character simply to demonstrate that he could. This is likely to turn into a long post, as we have played a lot of games with this guy over the course of a few years, and while there are too many instances of his behavior to mention, or even fully remember all of, I've tried to boil it down to three campaigns and the problem behavior in each. As I've seen other posts do this, let me set the scene by laying out the important players involved in the core story. We had a large group, but only a handful are relevant to this post. Names, of course, are changed from their originals. Kolya, the problem player in question. Me. Me. Sometimes a player, sometimes a DM, mostly a player. Freddy, the bullied player who looked up to Kolya a lot and was very susceptible to his toxicity. Virginia, another player who becomes relevant in the second part of this post. Will, a player who joined our group late into the chronology of this story, but became key in the third and final part of this post. Sebastian, DM for the campaign played in the third part of this post. Okay, without further ado. Campaign 1. Encounters. Encounters never change. Kolya was the first DM most of us had ever played with. I had played some one-on-one -on -one online games before, so this was my very first TTRPG both in person and around the table, and with a group. Virginia and Freddy were getting their first taste of RPGs too, with Virginia and I joining a campaign in progress in a Curse of Strahd game. This campaign, as far as I remember, went fine. I'm sure there were red flags in retrospect but none of which necessarily stood out to me at the time. There were some rigmarole where Kolya, our DM, focused a massive homebrewed side story on Freddy's character, making the naturally skittish and paranoid Freddy quite anxious about every action that his character took. But this just seemed like part of the game and overall the horror vibe of the setting. Overall, we had fun and our experience as a group began to bring us all closer together. Successful first game. Even if Strahd ultimately crushed us into a humiliating TPK, well, maybe that was the first of one of the red flags. We had begun playing during a second night of the week on top of our weekly sessions, both to try different campaigns and or systems and allow other people to get a shot at DMing. As a player, Kolya favored finely tuned, optimized builds that allowed him to dominate in sessions, doing everybody's jobs better than their specialized classes could do it themselves. 
This wasn't necessarily a bad thing, beyond a few bruised egos. Power gamers are gonna power game. There's generally nothing wrong with it. We certainly had no issue with him having an optimized character sheet. What was significantly more frustrating was Kolya's penchant for metagaming. He would power through any and all attempts by the party to roleplay, or explore organically, saying out loud, I smell a quest giver, and barreling through scenes and locations just to get to what he thought was the next plot hook to set up the next quest and move through the game. He wanted to win at D&D, and would passive-aggressively mock other players for roleplaying, and not immediately knowing where to go to advance the plot, using his in-character voice to chide our characters for being STUPID IDIOTS, while in character, using meta terminology like plot hook or quest giver. At one point we skipped an entire settlement because he straight up asked the DM where the plot hook was, so he could beeline straight to it get the salient points of the quest we had to do, and then zip off again with us having no other chance but to follow along in his wake. It was frustrating, especially as while we had no problems with his well-optimized builds, we were by and large a party of role players, and liked getting sidetracked with NPCs and other silly nonsense that you get up to while messing around in D&D. So, believe it or not, a lot of people who watch my channel actually don't play D&D, or are totally new to the hobby. So for the benefit of the uninitiated, metagaming is essentially using outside information to further your character's own goals in-game. This is generally frowned upon because it breaks immersion in the game and reminds players that they're just playing a game. D&D and other RPGs are excellent forms of escapism, and some people really like their immersion, like OP said. I mean, come on, man, I'm an antisocial loser who can't even work up the courage to make his own doctor's appointments for 365 days a year. Just give me a few hours where I can pretend to be a muscular, charismatic badass who kills demons and shit. <laughs> But this approach to D&D became amplified when he found himself back in the DM's chair after a hiatus, running a second iteration of Curse of Strahd. We had signed up to this eagerly, looking forward to a chance to avenge our first party's defeat, and to his credit, Kolya weaved in some background lore that made it clear that the first party was canon in the history of the game setting, and that we were very much going to finish what they started but either tempered by his previous experience metagaming as a player, or emboldened by our group's closer friendship bonds by this point, we had been playing together now for well over a year. This is where his DMing style went off the rails. His I must win at D&D &D attitude he had demonstrated as a player is now how he approached the business of DMing. Except instead of trying to win the campaign, he was trying to win against the party. More or less, there's very important, very annoying caveat to that mindset that I will get to below. At this point, through his behavior around the table and as a player, he had already sunk his hooks into Freddy, and had Freddy worn down and tormented by his teasing, mainly in-game. It got to the point where his constant degrading of Freddy's in-character decisions and actions had convinced Freddy that he was, in Freddy's own words, too stupid for D&D. &D. Freddy was, in fact, a player whose encyclopedic knowledge of the rules was matched by his great and often hilarious role-playing instincts, and was a very creative and skilled DM to boot. But that low self-confidence had allowed Kolya to build himself up in Freddy's mind as the paragon of all things D&D such that whenever Kolya questioned anything, Freddy was quick to back him up and claim that he was right. When Kolya suggested anything, Freddy ate it up unquestioningly. Kolya had, as one example, led Freddy to believe that mending was the most important cantrip in the game, after an episode involving a torn and thus illegible letter prompting Freddy to make sure that every character he ever rolled up for one of Kolya's games had mending. Freddy would go to great lengths to mention that he had taken mending, as if seeking Kolya's approval. 
As it turned out, by design or luck of the draw, Kolya's second iteration of Curse of Strahd never once involved a necessary use of the spell Mending. Freddy's broken self-esteem and submissive behavior towards Kolya was an important facet in how the campaign played out. Freddy's natural nervousness and paranoia, stoked by Kolya's constant bullying, would lead him to stress out out of character, over the most mundane details in character. We were going to vaguely Eastern European-esque country in another plane of existence. Would it be cold? Would we need heavy coats? Q. Kolya insisting that the entire party spend 10 gold apiece to purchase heavy coats, or suffer penalties from cold weather. We, in fact, later suffered penalties from being too hot because we actually wore the coats. This pedantic approach to little details swamped down almost every action the party tried to take. Try to open a locked door? Not only do you fail, but you have to roll an exceedingly high deck save to avoid falling down. Fail that save? Well, you take 1d6 damage. And you also just bumped into the person behind you, who now has to roll the same high deck save and, oh, they fell down? Well, the next person now has to roll, and so on and so on. Thus, the entire party became too afraid to touch or do anything, lest we fall victim to this kind of HP and time-draining nonsense. At least two players lost their characters in their first sessions through this kind of pedantic nonsense. One dwarf who went prone thanks to triggering a trap kept rolling low, which meant the DM insisted meant he kept standing up and falling over again, taking more damage on the fall. This continued until the dwarf was literally dead. <laughs> I like to imagine that the floor is just like covered in banana peels and shit, and the dwarf just kept slipping and giving himself brain damage until he died. <laughs> oh, so stupid. This continued until the dwarf was literally dead. And this attitude carried into encounters too. And oh, there were a lot of encounters. After the first session of the new campaign, we had, somehow, I am positive we were all only level 1 at this time, managed to kill a werewolf. There were, admittedly, a lot of us in the group, as I have said before. After the session, the DM called us all stupid to our faces for not dead-checking the dead wolf, claiming that it was now going to roll death saves and get up to fight us again. We called bullshit on this saying that it's not as if every monster in the game is expected to get death saves when they drop to zero HP. While we were willing to accept that sure, while the DM can rule that particular monsters do, in fact, get death saves, we certainly weren't stupid for not thinking of it, since every monster we had fought in D&D at that point, and tellingly, every monster we would go on to fight in this campaign, just died as soon as they hit zero HP. There's a reason how you want to do this was our group's wink wink nudge nudge traditional way of ending a fight. But as mentioned, Freddy by this point was so subservient to Kolya's will and way of thinking that he took Kolya's side and lamented out loud that we, him included, were doomed to fail this campaign because we were too stupid for what was coming. Freddy's self-esteem issues would later manifest in a toxic and dangerous way of their own. But that's very much another story. And while the dead checking didn't go beyond that single event, I suspect Kolya pulled that decision to give the werewolf death saves out of his ass just to mock us for something that wasn't even strictly in the rules, his encounters continued to bog down the game. There was no rhyme or reason as to what we would be fighting, or where. To an extent, it became clear that he was just pulling out monsters that he was excited to run. We fought a death claw the week after Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes was released, for example. But we fought it on a boat, for some reason, in a raging storm on the high seas, having been transported there by a magical lake or something. Every attempt to finesse encounters, scout them out, avoid them, or find a way to gain strategic or tactical advantage would fall flat. Kolya, after all, was DM, and the world was his to command. 
Thus, every plan the players ever came up with would coincidentally run into some entirely unforeseen complication or blocker that we were stupid for not seeing all along. Cue Freddy's almost wailing lamentations, and that we were just not able to handle this campaign, and were all doomed. At this point, I grew increasingly frustrated with his chiding of the players for not being able to foresee random decisions that he as a DM made just to frustrate our efforts. Upon reflection, I suspect that he was well aware of how arbitrary his own powers were and was intentionally doing it as some sort of weird, sad power trip. The encounters, meanwhile, would roll on endlessly. We finish up one arbitrary random encounter and stumble into the next, ad nauseum. Until at one point I mentioned to Virginia that we had been fighting in random encounters with no forward plot progression for somewhere in the ballpark of 12 plus hours spread across multiple sessions. And it wasn't as if these encounters added to the sense of survival horror that is supposed to permeate the Curse of Strahd campaign. Oh no, nothing so well thought out or carefully paced. We never lost resources as a result of these encounters that raised the stakes of the campaign. We would always be restored to full resources after one of these random encounters, be it through a long rest or some NPC having some spell to bring us all back to full fighting strength, just in time for our next session long battle. In the instances, and there were many, where the encounters overpowered us and threatened a TPK, random NPCs from elsewhere in the setting would show up to deus ex machina us to safety and heal us up, so that the next encounter could begin. That's when I think Virginia and myself finally spoke up against these encounters. When it became apparent that this wasn't even about the DM beating the players, he wasn't killing us, he was just dragging us kicking and screaming through these boring, pointless encounters. Either because he wanted to prove he simply could, or simply because he was bored of the campaign itself. One final detail of his DMing of Curse of Strahd that deserves a special mention are the sheer volume of nat 20s he rolled in combat against players. They were endless, and not blind either. He often made a point to roll them in front of the DM screen so that we could all see it happening. Cue, you guessed it, more distressed wailing from Freddy. And at the time, we just accepted that he was getting lucky. There was a running joke in the group that Kolya could control dice. And once your friend group has acclimatized behavior as a running gag, it's hard to see it objectively. But upon reflection, Virginia has suggested to me that either his dice were loaded, or he had somehow engineered a way to fake roll to make sure it came up on the number he wanted. He had an unusual way of rolling which involved him placing the die in the palm of his hand, then tilting his hand to let it fall straight onto the table. No roll, just a fall. Looking back, I can't believe we didn't say anything about it at the time. As a DM now, I never allow players to get away with not properly rolling dice. Though we eventually forced this campaign to end, he started to DM what was supposed to be a one-shot almost a year later, where all of the same behavior, the ridiculous character-killing slapstick saves, the endless encounters, the punishing player ingenuity by arbitrarily ruling on what was going to work, etc., came to be exhibited again. We came to the decision to quietly dissuade him from ever DMing for our group again. But then the virus hit, and forced us to be apart anyway. And his growing out of game toxicity eventually forced us to cut ties with him for good. So that sets the stage, I think, for the behavior that was to follow in the other two campaigns DM'd by others in our group, myself included. I appreciate that this is a lengthy post, so if you read this far, thanks! You're welcome! I'd love to hear your opinions in the comments to let us know if we're collectively crazy or not for chafing against Kolya's attitude. Before we move on to campaign 2, I'm going to interject with my thoughts. No OP, I don't think you're crazy. As much as I like to poke fun at OPs, I think your reaction and delivery is 100% justified in this case. 
If I had a choice of having a problem player be the DM or a member of my party, I would try to keep them as far away from the DM chair as possible. Unsurprisingly, the my ruling literally has more sway than the rule book, I am the god of this world type role tends to attract some rather controlling people. The DM holds ultimate power in a D&D game, true, but the player DM relationship is a lot more complicated than that. The DM is actually a servant of the players, not the other way around. You may have ultimate power, but your role is to ensure that your players are having a good time, not to try and dominate them in a sad attempt to show off how powerful you are. That's a one ticket ride into magically transforming people who were your friends into people who just tolerate your bullshit. <laughs> Another thing to consider is that the players hold the ultimate trump card over the DM. They can leave. And what is a DM with no players? Just a sad being sitting in their mother's basement surrounded by untouched rule books, miniatures, and dice. Try to remember this image next time you consider making yourself the subject of one of these horror stories, alright? But don't do it too often or else I'm gonna lose all my material to read on the channel. Campaign 2. Little Man with a Nowhere Plan Eventually, I had built up enough rapport with this group, and was confident enough to run Vampire the Masquerade, 20th Anniversary Edition. This turned into a slow-burning disaster, because of how broken the system is and how inexperienced I was DMing for such a large group of players. When I later ran a Vampire 5th edition campaign for the same group, plus and minus a few faces, it went off a lot smoother and had a much more satisfactory ending. Kolya, for the most part, was manageable as a player. He was gracious when a ruling didn't go his way, and would state his objections to it out of character in person, but accept it in good humor at the table. A perfectly valid and much appreciated approach to respecting the DM and not causing trouble. He would even accept rulings in this way, when I was clearly wrong and he was right, and as a result, on more than one occasion, I realized my mistake, admitted it, and allowed him the benefits of whatever rule or event he was objecting to my decision on. I can't fault him for that. He demonstrated an attitude that anyone could stand to learn from as a player. V20 was a horrendously broken system with a famously badly written rulebook, so these sorts of disagreements about specific rules cropped up a lot. The problem was not so much on the meta level, but I guess the macro level. Through his antics as a player and as a DM in Curse of Strahd, Kolya had affected this god complex whereby he presented himself as a master of every game we played. Someone who was always working the angles and always had a grand plan that would reveal itself at the opportune moment. Unfortunately, Freddy, as mentioned above, bought into this act completely and fundamentally, so much so that Kolya's persona effectively took on a life of its own as a running joke within the group, similarly to his mastery of rolling dice. Once you had made an idea like that part of an in-joke, it's very hard to get out from underneath it. This was, apparently, true for Kolya too, who seemed to buy into his own hype, and went into my vampire campaign preparing to tear down the setting I had crafted, based on our own home city, to dominate the world of Vampire the Masquerade. This manifested at first as it usually did. Kolya attached himself to Freddy's character and established himself in a dominant position over him, tormenting him both in and out of game, and whittling down Freddy's already bedrock low confidence. This got so bad, in fact, that after a series of failed roles during a bar fight between Freddy's character and an NPC, Freddy broke down a little fretting about how terribly made his character was and how he just wasn't smart enough to play this game. He actually went quiet at the table and refused to contribute for the rest of the session. It was clear he was on the verge of tears. Myself and Virginia went out of our way to assure him that this was not the case, that the dice sometimes just don't fall the way that you want them to, and I made sure that the consequences of his lost bar fight were severely mitigated. 
nobody had an issue with this. Freddy was clearly upset and I didn't want him to have to throw away a character that he loved. He had worked so hard on his backstory and had been super excited to talk through various character details with me. Freddy's character ended up in the hospital and Colia went to see him. Before anything could happen, three vampires from a rival faction who both Colia and Freddy had pissed off showed up to attack them, causing both of them to run away. Colia, however, always made sure to let Freddy know that he had gone there with the intent of killing his character. I cannot be sure if this is true or just more mind games to dominate and bully Freddy. I am sure, however, that had he attempted to go through with it, I would have strictly disallowed it. It's Vampire the Masquerade. Some interplayer rivalry and intrigue is to be expected, but at my table I have a strict consent rule. You can do anything you want to another player's character, provided that that player has consented beforehand. If not, you can't so much as touch a hair on their head. This issue of player consent and player on player aggression in fact would become a major issue in the climax of the Colia story, in part 3 below. PVP. You know it, you love it, but you also hate it. Can I just say how much I love OP's consent rule? PVP can be fun, but it's definitely not for everyone. Some people really just don't want their characters being touched by other PCs, and that's totally fine. But I wouldn't just disallow PVP combat from the table entirely. In some circumstances, it can be really fun. It flips the team game narrative that RPGs have on its head and mixes it up a little bit. Plus, it can make for some awesome roleplay scenarios where the two feuding parties eventually mend their metaphorical wounds and become ever stronger companions afterwards. We have an in-joke in the games that I DM where my party has a habit of splitting itself into two distinct factions over certain dilemmas. Oftentimes, these disagreements will come to blows. We call these fights the Civil Wars, in reference to the Marvel comic storylines. I think my party is on like Civil War 4 at this point. But it's important to note that we use these PvP moments as an opportunity for roleplay, and never as a way to screw over other players. However, I have a feeling that Colia isn't after good roleplay. The thing was, and this is the kicker that defined Kolya's entire experience of my campaign, Kolya was only some kind of tabletop Jesus in Freddy's mind. As a player, while great at optimizing his builds and working out the mechanical end of things, he was fairly average. And there's nothing wrong with that. I consider myself to be an average player and honestly subpar DM. But then you're trying to live up to a persona that you yourself have crafted of being a four-dimensional chess playing Bill... Belichikian? I have no idea who that is. Super player. That is where you can start to struggle if the stake doesn't live up to the sizzle. And Kolya struggled. In order to prove he was bigger than the game world his character existed in, he had no regard for the structures of authority I had put in place around his character and the setting. He attacked his superiors. He attacked powerful vampires from other factions. He betrayed the trust of quest givers and party members alike. Now, as I said, this is Vampire the Masquerade. Anybody even remotely familiar with the game setting knows how autocratic its power structures are, how tyrannical its characters and how constrained low-level players are in how they get to operate in and shape the world around them. Very quickly, Kolya had pissed off just about every major player in my city, and was on the run for his life against every vampire faction worth mentioning. This led him to some erratic and strange behavior, as if in a bid to prove to the party that not to worry this was all part of his plan, kidnapping the child of a powerful Ventru and Scylla, embracing, i.e. making vampires of, three random club goers, and then leaving them to starve in a house when he realized that he didn't actually want to be responsible for three terrified and starving newborn vampires. He had no real plan for his characters, beyond trying to make it look as if they were working towards some grand scheme that only he could see, 
and that Freddy, of course, was overawed by, despite nothing Colia did ever coming to fruition. After abandoning the three clubbers he had turned into vampires, he discovered that the Ventru Asilla's Cotier had marked him for death. So he decided to return to the house he had left the baby vampires in, only to find it surrounded by police investigating a homicide on the site. The Ventru's child had been kidnapped, then murdered. I teed this up with the room to spare. He saw the flashing light Sam the police tape from down the street. All he had to do was turn around and walk away. But of course, he decided he could take on a whole cohort of police. So he charged the barricade. And died. That was character number one. I would later allow him to spontaneously resurrect character one, when he similarly screwed up character two based on a misinterpretation of damage rules on my part when the combat encounter with police was playing out. And it's during Character 2 that the bigger problems of the campaign started. Because while Kolia had been flailing around ineffectually, trying to convince everyone that he was playing a Byzantine long-game grandmaster plan that would shock and wow all of us and break my game forever, Virginia's character was actually doing something of the kind. Long story short, for those who are familiar with the game, my game was set in an anarch-free state that was crumbling internally through the corruption of the Baron and the growing influence of the Sabbat among its younger vampires. The Tremere in this setting were independent, having broken ties with the Camarilla after the Anarchs replaced them, but refusing to kowtow to the Baron. They were a powerful enough faction that the Anarchs tolerated their independence, albeit nervously. Virginia was playing one such tremere, and had, through the course of the campaign up to this point, started to engineer an alliance between the tremere and the Sabbat, to overthrow the Baron and split the city between the two factions. I was impressed and a few other players around the table began to gravitate towards the impromptu side story that Virginia had created through her own actions, and the game increasingly became about this dawning unholy alliance, and whether the players would, as a group, stand by and let the Sabbat cannibalize the city, or stand against them. Kolya did not like this. Not one little bit. After all his posturing, and after so many humiliations, when his nonsensical actions failed to materialize in some sort of success, he was not happy that Virginia had gone and lucked into doing exactly that. He began to take whatever actions he could to try and hamper Virginia's plans, both through metagaming and through desperate flails that, like his erratic attempts to string together a coherent plot up to that point, made no sense and only backfired massively. His second character, an Asamite, think of the Hashashin from Assassin's Creed but vampires, basically played himself out of the game by, after completing a quest, taking a van and randomly, without any character motivation or explanation, driving it through the front lobby of the Tremere's headquarters in the city. I told him that this would basically mean he would become a marked man by his own clan. He had just carried out an unsanctioned act of war against one of the city's most feared factions, a war that his clan had no reason to persecute, when they could just hand him over by way of restitution. Kolya accepted this, and agreed that his character would essentially go into hiding, and out of the game. By this point, he and I had discussed my mistake with counting damage for his previous character who had gone down in a hail of police bullets. So I was happy to let that character suddenly reanimate in a city morgue somewhere, and get back into the game. He still bore the weight of several angry vampires out for his head, but he was back in the game. His first action upon getting clear of the morgue was to take a stolen cell phone, that had been a major factor in his previous antagonizing of Freddy, and declare that he was going to ring Virginia's character. Immediately, Virginia, already pissed off about the unprompted attack on her clan's base, questioned why he would do that. For context, this character had no interaction with Virginia's Tremere character. 
He, in proving that he was above the party and the game, had gone off on his own while Virginia and the others were together being fed plot hooks. His character, in-universe, had seen Virginia in passing all of once. He never exchanged any words with her. And then he went off to kidnap that aforementioned powerful vampire's child. His character probably couldn't even remember her, much less claim to have known his phone number. Virginia pointed all of this out, and it became clear that Colia was only trying to involve himself in her story, now that she had effectively outplayed him. I disallowed the phone call, on the grounds that he literally had no in-character reason to make it, and probably didn't have her number anyway. The campaign didn't last much longer after that, as I eventually became so frustrated with V20, I effectively rage quit from the system. The players were okay with this, as by that time we had started to explore the V5 rules, and I had promised that this story would continue after a short break in the V5 system. Kolya had exhibited his game-breaking behavior on both sides of the DM screen, but what he did next is what put the group on the downward spiral towards finally ejecting him for good. I'm aware of how long this post is, so I'll try to keep the final part brief, which is helped along by the fact that it why wasn't present for most of the final campaign. So, I know most of what I know through conversations with either Will or Virginia. So I'd like to apologize for my pronunciation of any of the words I have never played Vampire the Masquerade in my entire life. It seems like an interesting system, and I've always wanted to give it a try. That being said, I think we should address the elephant in the room. Freddy. To me, this seems like a borderline abusive relationship here, stemming from Kolya's obsession with control. If complete and utter control is what you want, then TTRPGs aren't going to be your game. And I think Kolya actually knows this. At the end of the day, where he may fail in his master plans, he will always have his hooks in Freddy. And that's terrifying to me. Unlike in TTRPGs like Vampire the Masquerade, where your controlling nature doesn't really have too many lasting effects, this is a person. And I can only imagine what kind of damage that Kolya is doing to Freddy. Of all the relationships like this I've seen, it either ends prematurely, thank God, or it gets really, really messed up for everyone involved. A lot of people ask, like, oh, why, why don't they leave? I would have been gone, like, day one, blah, 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 blah. Well, this is why. The problem player isn't always a fat, weeb neckbeard we could all point and laugh at. A lot of the time, these problem players are people we hold dear. They're close friends, they're family. And it becomes really hard to break away when it feels almost like an abusive relationship in a way. You hate this person when they're at the D&D table, but you love them everywhere else. Every situation is different, and every situation is a lot more nuanced than OP always describes it, so... I'm going to reserve my judgment for Freddy for right now. Sure, he may look like an idiot and he may look super pathetic to an outsider, but it's really hard to see things from the perspective of someone who is being controlled by a manipulator like Kolya. So I'm going to try my best to not be as harsh on Freddy as I am on other people in my videos. But Kolya's a dickhead. <laughs> And I can laugh at Kolya all I want. And I'm sure I'll be doing plenty of that in part three. Campaign three, blue on blue. Halfway through my vampire campaign, we had admitted a new player into the group, Will. He had gotten off to a rocky start by his own actions derailing another player's plans and upsetting them. But this was his very first time playing a tabletop game. And considering how apologetic he was when he ultimately realized what he had done, and how quickly he learned and moved on, we had accepted him, and he became as good of a friend to us as anyone else in the group. That new player status proved to make Will Colia's next obsession when it came time for us to play Pathfinder, in a pre-baked adventure module DM'd by Sebastian. The player whose character had died in Curse of Straw due to the never-ending damage-inducing slapstick rolls. Kolya immediately began to harass and prank Will's character. 
using both Will's inexperience as a player and his character's naivete to bully and torment his character much in the same fashion as I described he did to Freddy. Now, for reasons unrelated to this, Will eventually decided to switch his character out and play something more in keeping with the villainous tone of the party. Sebastian was fine with this, so Will rolled up a lizard folk barbarian and inserted himself as a bodyguard character to Virginia's witch character, so that he could learn the complicated Pathfinder system and not have to be in the foreground where the decision making was taking place. This, apparently, did not sit well with Kolya, who had effectively lost his new favorite plaything. Now that Will was playing a gruff, soft-spoken brute who didn't rise to provocation and generally kept his own counsel, Kolya was instantly aggressive towards Will's new character, openly admitting that he was planning on killing him, which he finally did by use of a charm person spell. As an aside, I don't know how in the blue hell Sebastian allowed this to happen. How, as a DM, he didn't know what the spell did, didn't check the way the spell worked when this all started, and why, even on a meta level, he didn't just simply shut this the fuck down when it became clear what was happening. But whatever the case was, as I said, I wasn't actually present, he didn't intervene when Kolya announced that he was casting Charm Person on Will, and without sharing the rules text for the actual spell itself, explained how this allowed Kolya to convince Will's character to kill himself. Which Will's character then proceeded to do, as narrated by Kolya, gruesomely clawing his own throat until he finally died. Will was so disturbed he didn't know how to react. Virginia was furious. The game didn't last beyond that session. And then the virus put the brakes on any plans we may have had to continue playing thereafter. After this, a few out-of-game flare-ups with Kolia led me eventually to disinviting him from my promised sequel to the Vampire Campaign, which he took about as well as would be expected. He blocked the bulk of us on social media, and we removed him from our various group chats thereafter. The rest of us did get to play together again, but when our country briefly loosened its lockdown restrictions last summer, and without his presence, we ended up having an exceptionally fun couple of games. A vampire sequel DM'd by me, and Kingmaker DM'd by Sebastian, where we were able to focus on roleplay and inter-party dynamics. Freddy found his feet much more comfortably in the post colia group, and became one of the leading lights in my vampire campaign cutting his own deals under the table with various NPC power brokers, and making his own plays now that the shadow had been taken off from over him. While there were other issues around Kolya's behavior, like him insisting on hosting D&D games in his hotel room so he could make creepy advances at some of the females in our group, or the time he decided that the venue we always played at, which worked for and was quite liked by everybody, was no longer good enough for him, and then got upset and mopey when he realized nobody was going to research possible alternatives for him, and that if he had a problem with where we played, we expected him to be able to suggest alternatives. I am aware at how long this post has gone on so far, so I thank you for reading this far. You're welcome, and won't take up any more of your time. TLDR DM and player tries flexing on group during games relentlessly bullies another player until he's nervous and paranoid, bogging down an entire campaign in pedantic technicalities and endless encounters, ruins player plans to make sure they always fail so he can triumphantly call the group stupid for not understanding his genius, tries to derail another player's character when he realizes they are playing the game better than him, and finally cheats and makes up a rule that allows him to suddenly and violently kill a player's character for not allowing him to bully them anymore. End of story. So, I think at this point you all understand the social vampire title that I gave this video. Kolya was a social vampire. Someone who latched on to unsuspecting victims in their social circle to feed off their insecurities and paranoia. I'm just happy that in this case, Kolya was identified as a social vampire, and then promptly destroyed via wooden stake to the heart. 
Now, before we go, let's go ahead and take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drake. This week's fan art comes from user Speed Paint with Rules and depicts me as a stand from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I've never watched it, but I've heard good things. And apparently, this is a pretty powerful stand. <clears throat> Let me go ahead and get my anime voice ready. Den of the Drake. This stand grows stronger the more cringe the user intakes. This can be hoarded to use a burst of power. Theoretically, this stand could grow infinitely stronger because it keeps a small amount of power from the bursts. It normally takes the form of a small dragon, but when it intakes a high dosage of cringe, it can grow into a large witty dragon that people love. Thank you again, Speed Paint with Rules, for submitting your art. If you want to see your artwork featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to submit it to the email in my About section. Fan art is my favorite part of this channel and it means the world to me that I can make content that inspires viewers like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and the artwork displayed, we're gonna go ahead and end the video here. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Drake.